Hello to all my unconventional people out there. Welcome back to another episode of Unconventional Money Moves. I am your host, Josh Krafchick. Thanks for joining us. I have a very special guest, super nice guy, super smart, knows the ins and outs of all the things that you don't even know what's happening. And Ken Silva is an advisor. And today he's going to share things that people such as Patrick Bet David are talking about in terms of having your values aligned with your investment strategy. So Ken, what's 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 going on with all this? Because I know you and I have talked about ESG and ESG has been something that has been taking the main stage of late. And I know that people such as Patrick Bet David, who have a pretty big following, that was like a huge part of like why he exited his business and got such a an enormous amount because how his company was set up. So like what's going on with value lines investing and ESG and what do people just not even know about it? Yeah. So I can, I can put it simply and thank you for the introduction, Josh. Uh, you're a nice fellow as well. Um, the, uh, the, the difference between ESG and what we call now values aligned investing is uh, values aligned investing is bottom up and ESG is top down. Uh, ESG uh, requires a score uh, that gets applied to a corporation. And there are certain agencies that uh, issue these scores, um, whereas values aligned investing allows the individual to choose what's in their portfolio. And that requires much more in-depth granular uh, scoring metrics uh, taken from all over uh, not just uh, one scoring agency um, by questionable ownership. Um, uh, so we, we aggregate data from all over the place and uh, allow the investor to choose what's in their portfolios to align with their values. That's how it has always been. Um, and it goes back to, uh, to the 18th century in the 1700s where uh, uh, the Quakers and, and, uh, uh, the Methodist Church uh, started speaking about the importance of money and aligning it with your values. Um, there was a, a famous ser sermon um, by John Wellesley that uh, that that kind of kicked that off. And um, back then they were known as sin stocks. It was tobacco, firearms, and um, and al alcohol, liquor. Uh, soon thereafter, pornography was included as, as, uh, companies and, and, uh, uh, certain, uh, businesses started, uh, adopting different, different ways to make money. And, um, and it's just, you know, everyone should have the, the right to, uh, vote with their dollar. Um, and what has occurred here in my opinion and, uh, many others, and that's why there's such a, uh, such a you know so much noise uh, occurring is because it, it's very important that we that we call this out um, because they're taking what was uh, a decentralized effort uh, for individuals' values and they're co-opting it and placing uh, 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 basically a, a socialized cre credit score on corporations. And uh, it doesn't work that way. It won't work that way. It's fundamentally flawed. And uh, it's fundamentally flawed because it's, uh, it goes into, you know, some of uh, Thomas Sowell's teachings, uh, whereas you don't want to uh, force uh, equality through outcome. Uh, it's, it's, in, it's in stark contrast uh, with equality of opportunity which is what we have now uh, to, you know, to certain degrees, or ideally is, is what we're driving for the content of, of one's character rather and their merit rather than uh, certain uh, more shallow surface level attributes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was just looking up and I saw this not too long ago. Um, these are the top 10 holdings of the Mormon church's $51 billion stock portfolio. So you mentioned like how you were, the church said like invest in things. I mean, the top holdings, Microsoft, Apple, Google, Amazon, NVIDIA, MasterCard, Tesla, 
is this have anything to do with what you're talking about? Well, I'm not uh I'm not particularly uh well versed in in uh, the Mormon teachings and the Me me neither. I haven't I I haven't seen the Book of Mormon the play, but I've heard good things about it. Or if their if their holdings align with their their you know, we 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 would assume that they they would, right? Um you would assume that with uh um you know, it it happens uh it's not just black and white. Um You've said it yourself, Josh, you know, you said that uh, corporations these days are, are um, in a sense, kind of like a, a, a mutual fund in the way that they uh, uh, acquire and, and merge. And, and uh, yeah, It's all about creating a, a big moat around your castle. So if someone tries to infiltrate your castle, you got defense systems, you have a moat, you got archers, you got cannons, you got people on horses back in the day. So, yeah, I mean, creating a huge moat is what these companies are doing. And when people started investing, uh, companies weren't as sophisticated as they were back in the day. So investing in a mutual fund made sense because typically one company had one revenue stream. Nowadays, Google, Microsoft, Apple have acquired so many companies. And that's where a lot of people that study modern portfolio theory don't understand because a company like Google are like, well, how much bigger can Google get from a revenue standpoint? I mean, they're already worth like almost what three they're coming up on three trillion. I think I think they're over two trillion for sure. So it's like, well, they acquire companies and then eventually five to seven years later, those profits start flowing down. And with like the internet now, the internet is an infinite space. That's the way I look at it. I don't know. I don't know how you see it. <laughs> I see it as the only thing that's that's uh, close to permanent here. Uh, you know, we, we in outside of the internet, uh, we have uh, an, an ever present moment of now, and then uh, how that's remembered, uh, it, it, it's individual. You know, and there's a consensus. Whereas the internet, uh, you know, I was just on the wayback machine right before this call. <laughs> you know, to things that weren't on that were considered deleted, but it's all there. It's all mm -hmm. permanent in the two-dimensional world yeah so with like uh, esg when i like look up certain things i typically always see f familiar names on being top holdings of individual companies like vanguard blackrock uh, vanguard has done a phenomenal job because people invest in exchange trade funds because they're like well i invest in exchange trade fund because i know exactly what i'm gonna get and, and no one can ever beat the market so why would i invest in individual companies are are these companies the ones that are like pushing for this against this? Like what is happening there? Well, you know, once again, I'll have, I'll have to, uh, I'll have to start with the disclosure. Uh, securities discussed in this conversation aren't investment advice and, and will not be uh, considered a, a financial advice. Um, and in no way, shape or form are we telling you to, to invest in any of these uh uh, singular companies or or styles of investing. What we're what we're trying to do here is uh, give you some insight on on what occurred and and when and why uh, and why it's important. And when you talk when you speak about BlackRock and Vanguard, you you're you're speaking about the largest uh, both investment vehicles and uh, corporations on earth. So the the largest in investment vehicle. Uh, being pensions and retirement funds um, are also uh, mostly funded by Vanguard and, and uh, uh, well, TIAA, CREF, mm -hmm. um, these these types of uh, um, funds in order to, and those are the only options. Uh, well, up until a couple of years ago, those were almost the only options that uh, employees were were uh, given the given the choice to uh, to decide upon. Uh, you know, there was little choice in that in that arena. And um, and if you put a social if you put a credit, if you put a score on a, a company and only those companies with the highest score get included into those funds, well, then you're completely centralizing. Um, it, it's a you know, it's a high school uh, uh, football team here that were you know, uh, out, uh, like a uh, sort of like a. A, a dodgeball team more like you know 
I want the big guy on the end because uh, I know, you know, um, he's got these surface uh, level attributes that uh, are for some reason a, a social consensus has been made on how we're going to uh, draft the rubric for this test and then apply a metric to it. Mm -hmm. And um, so when someone's I, like I, investing into like an exchange traded fund at Vanguard, Vanguard then owns the shares of that company. And then Vanguard gets the vote on everything that that company is voting on. So essentially by investing in those funds, people are handing off the reins to Vanguard to vote on these important issues. Is that what's at stake here? Well, there is something in uh, in this style of investing and in, in values-based investing that's it's it's uh, it involves uh, your proxy vote and uh, and and voting. Um, you have a right with every share of stock that you purchase. You you have a right to to vote, uh, and if you uh, don't vote that right, uh, that's okay. You know, you just probably most likely weren't aware of it. Um, there are certain rules and, and uh, uh, conditions that go along with that. Uh, one of them is you have to own $2,500 worth of that particular share uh, for three years, right? And so uh, at following that, if you were to vote your proxy, um, a shareholder resolution would probably uh, underlie that. So you would co-sponsor that resolution and, and go from there. But yeah, that that is how, that is one way that you can change the corporations from the from the inside, if you're aware, if the investor is aware of that. But particularly, most investors aren't aware of that. That that's an attribute of uh, of owning a share of stock. So, what about this, Ken? Is has you so passionate about it to share it with investors and share it with people in terms of making them aware of what's happening with this uh, value lines investing in this ESG? That's a really good question. You know, I haven't, I haven't, put, I haven't put too too much thought into that. But what I can tell you is that, you know, I was a chef, I was a chef my whole life. I was a professional chef, um, and I was involved in a movement called the slow food movement. So we opened farm to table restaurants. Um, that was the the style of cooking that I liked. I liked uh, local farms and then highlighting their ingredients. Right. And so wherever I would go, I was a member of this uh, slow food movement. And years later, um, my grandmother was passing. She was a CFP. Um, she was one of the first female CFPs in the country. And uh, she was passing. She asked me to help my grandfather retire. And so I got my seven, my, my 66, and I, I started getting going with that. Well, they were the, the investments that they had available to their clients I looked at them and I said, well, does, does, does the client get to uh, any choice in what goes into their portfolio, right? So, um, so I started looking for a way to do it myself, to allow the, the client to, to mirror what they cared about. If they didn't want to hold a certain security, I, I, who am I to say, oh, uh, yeah, you know, but we also have to reach investment objectives as an advisor. And so... Uh, so that particular uh, technology exists and it existed at the time. Um, and so I started building my own portfolios and, and uh, allowing the client to either divest, include or exclude certain uh, uh, securities. Around that same time, I, I met up with a group of people and uh, they were they had already been doing this for years, uh, like, you know, at least a decade. When, and, when uh, was this just like timeline wise? What year was this? This was in 2015. Okay, so and, almost uh, 10 years ago. Almost 10 years ago. And um, and so about two years after that, after I met up with this whole community of people, um, and, and, you know, they're, they're global, um, that's when I started seeing uh, these large corporations come started coming to our conferences. They started coming to our conferences. You know, we had Larry Fink at one of our conferences, CEO of BlackRock. And, uh, and that's when I started seeing the term ESG come in. And so I, I did a deeper dive. I'm like, what is this ESG? You know, it's been SRI for the, since I've been in this and, uh, SRI means socially responsible investing or sustainable and responsible in investing. Um, and, uh, so what is ESG? 
what environmental societal and governance that's what it stands for and uh and who is who is pushing this uh this term because it was new to me um it was somewhat new to me and in it turns out in in uh 2005 uh esg was uh termed by the world bank in the un and so it took that long for it to slowly gain gain adoption because a lot of the people that I that I do this with, you know, they they did sign on to the the uh, PRI, which is the UN's principle principles for responsible investment. It's a you know it's a it's a good uh, outline to uh, uh, adopt these principles so that you're you're acting as a fiduciary not only for your client but mm-hmm. also for as an avatar for your client's uh, connection with the earth and uh, or what have you whatever stuff that's underneath our feet that we make above our feet in order to sell whatever you want to call it you know what i'm saying um so uh you that's that's our our position as an advisor uh in in a in a nutshell according to my opinion and so i started looking into it a little bit deeper and apparently um this has been uh kind of a key uh to a larger uh, agenda and uh i'm not the one who's uh who's uh, coining it uh, an agenda. Um, it was coined as an agenda in 1992. It was called Agenda 21, and that was held at at the uh, um, the Rio Declaration of Environment and Development um, in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, mm-hmm. and that was a UN conference in Brazil, um, a famous famous UN conference where uh, it was George Bush Senior who uh, who did his New World Order speech at that at that conference. And uh, so these these uh, environment and development principles uh, they were they were voted and and signed upon by 178 different governments from around the world in 1992 through something called Agenda 21. And when I was looking at it, it was mostly on the internet. It's mostly conspiracy theory stuff. Like that's what they that's what they call it, but it's not. It's 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 uh, <laughs> something that actually exists in 178 governments signed on to it. It's so far away from a uh, uh, conspiracy or any kind of theory, um, but that's what it kind of looks like on the internet. Um, and so since then that has been uh, adapted um, to the uh, agenda 2030. And that's what we're seeing right now. We're seeing kind of a, a coalition of, of people using this word, you know, 2030, we'll meet these, meet these uh, objectives by 2030. Um, which was once Agenda 21 um, and in 1992. And so it's outlined by the Sustainable Development Goals, which you can go onto the UN's website and you can look at them. Um, they're, they're highly granular and uh, very, very detailed on how they wish to go about um, meeting these goals by 2030. Now, you know, it, it, just five years ago or... or uh, it's, it's just been changed to, it, it was agenda 2020, uh, just five years ago. So, you know, they've been pushing it out, pushing it out. Cause they, what they really want is no borders and resource, uh, management. And it's not me who's saying this, it's, it's, it's on their website. Um, and the terms ESG, uh, being adopted and, uh, pushed into, uh, the largest corporations on earth with a public private partnership. Um, that's one way to do it. Um, I don't know if that's the way that it's going to get done, but that's, that's certainly, uh, um, one could imagine that that would be one way to do it. Um, but in order to do that, you, you couldn't have, uh, uh, any government or institution that wouldn't want to uh, sign on to your agenda and, and wouldn't want to uh, continue. So it, 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 would, it would require these metrics, um, these scores uh, in order to say, okay, this, this person uh, or this corporation, um, this per- corporation will be able to handle that. This corporation will be able to do that. Um, and so you could pick the best corporations in order to, uh, to manage uh, the resources on earth. And that's that's kind of the way that I see it right now. And the resources don't just uh, go to uh, commodities; or, or the, it's uh, human capital and uh, social capital. Uh, the, these uh, new kind of terms that were 
these these terms were um, they came about with with the Club of Rome's uh, paper limits of growth. I don't know if you're familiar with that. No. Um, but that's that's the concept that's taught in these in these in this curriculum um, is that there's a there's these limits to growth and we have to manage these resources in order to uh, um, well ease suffering. But in the same way, they uh, uh, they seem to uh, miss the mark on our connection with nature itself. So, um, in in my opinion, mm. you know. Yeah, I was looking up an article here from 2022 and said by the end of this year, and that's in 2022, it expected ESG labeled investments to be worth $41 trillion, which would be one third of global managed funds. So does this have anything to do with uh, Bill Gates being the largest owner of farmland in the United States? It may. Uh, you could you could make those uh, those connections. You know the um, the size of corporations, as we touched on earlier in the in the conversation, where uh, you know we're talking about A and M and 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 that sort of thing. Uh, we have to look at these corporations as though look even on the small level the line of good and evil runs right through every single one of our hearts. And it, when, as soon as one of us forgets that, that's when it comes out and you get to see uh, either, uh, you know, the worst part of people, right? When we forget that we have that inside of us, you know, each one of us, and we have to work on ourselves to better ourselves. It's a process, process of individuation, right? With these corporations that exist with, you know, tens of thousands of individuals, uh, and so each one of them has that ability to do that, to recognize that I can either do good or I can do, uh, less than good. I can, I can behave poorly and sell my soul and, 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 uh, you know, for this paycheck, because I have, uh, a child to feed or what have you, I can not tell the truth this one time, you know, um, but that's happening on such a grand scale that it's really hard to see what is occurring. Um, and when we talk about Bill Gate, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, um, you know, that that's something that I take into consideration every time that I look at one of these large institutional projects that has more funding uh, efforts. They they fund the the World Health Organization uh, larger than I think the the top three. The, the third largest funder of the World Health Organization. And so um, I can't say that it's black and white and, uh, and that it would be a good thing for to have some, uh, an institution such as that uh, involved in our resource management, but they are. And so it's up to us to, to speak out and to, uh, on the individual level too, you know, everything that we do matters. Um, every uh, holding in our portfolio matters. And so, uh, and whether it's Microsoft, because we have this association with Bill Gates and, and Microsoft, right? Because, um, uh, um, I mean, I, I don't know how long it's been since he's, he's uh, divorced himself from that, uh, that company, but um, it was probably a, a good thing to do because his image right now isn't that great. And, uh, and uh, you know, a lot of people aren't too happy with him. Um, so... But, I, you know, I'll pray for him um, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> so like when we see these like large foundations and they're making all of these contributions that on the front look like a good thing, such as inoculating polio and things like that through like Rotary. I know that's like Rotary's mission is like inoculating polio. And I remember seeing something where the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, so they would match dollar for dollar every Yep. everything that they they raised so if they raised 10 million dollars they they'd match 10 million dollars so what you're saying is this all has to do with controlling resources such as water food energy those sort of things yeah in in my uh in my uh, amateur uh, eyes <laughs> yes that's what that's what I have seen, and that's what is outlined on the websites of some of the largest institutions on earth. 
So is um, ESG a good thing or a bad thing in your your opinion? ESG itself is mm-hmm. is uh, uh, I see in no way that it can be a good thing. Um, just u- using it by itself and the other professionals in my industry, uh, people who have been doing this a very long time, see it the same way, and that's why they you can use ESG metrics in your in your uh, scoring overall scoring to to um, mirror the values of a client in their portfolio. Um, but you can't use ESG metrics alone because the largest banks on earth are the ones that are going to have the final say in what the rubrics to those tests are. And so the it's it's not about uh, the largest corporations on earth. It's about it's about families. It's about the individual investor and uh, and having uh, this term uh, um, get called out for what it is. I mean, look at even even uh, Larry Fink uh, from BlackRock. He, he's separated. He's separating himself from from ESG um, uh, because the, the public image, it's it's just on its face alone having a score for a corporation to get included into a fund. That's <laughs> Any, everyone knows that's not a that's not a good thing, you know. Um, it's it's not a good thing because uh, who is who's the one that holds these uh, the rubrics for these tests? Who's the one picking and choosing? You know, I mean, it's not just one person, but it's a. I mean, if you do your research, it's a couple of uh, corporations, and uh, and these these entities are, uh, um, you know. Part, part, the, one of the largest ones on earth is, is this is Sustainalytics on, from uh, the MSCI. MSCI stands for Morgan Stanley Capital Investments. That's, uh, um, you know, they, they, they did divest from, uh, from that indice, ownership of that indice in, uh, I think it was in 2007, uh, was the, the divestment efforts began. But you just got to know who's, who's in control and uh, who will have the ultimate say. And it should be uh, on the individual level as much as possible. And we should do our best to uh, keep it that way because it, it'll always, it'll always force itself in to uh, e- uh, equality of outcome. It, it won't, it, it won't exist in, in the way of uh, equality of possibility. And so, uh, so uh, equality having more of choice. outcome, equality of outcome, meaning the goal is to have everyone do the same so that way no one can get ahead or no one can get ahead of anyone else so that's like to me from an investment standpoint like exchange traded funds like everyone's going to do the exact same whether it's up down or flat or sideways or however however many different permutations you can come up with so by investing in these index funds essentially everyone that's investing in them is guaranteed to do the same. Um, however, we all know that people don't make the best choices, especially when things get crazy or they start getting, you know, typically when I see people reach over a half a million dollars and they've never had that much money and the market drops 10%, they're like, man, I just lost 50 grand. I got to do something different. And then like now you're getting all this activity there and people are buying and selling and doing all sorts of crazy things from a investment point of view. However, from ESG, like what does someone like who's listening to this need to at least spend like five or 10 minutes on so that they understand what ESG is and could potentially protect themselves for the future of their families. If, if they're looking at a investment portfolio that, that states that it uses ESG in it, um, just know that the, the, their values are not uh, being incorporated into their portfolio. Someone else chose those scores for you. It's not that difficult to, to comprehend that ESG, we don't have involvement in ESG. In the in the SRI, socially responsible investment investment world, the values aligned investment world, that's called greenwashing because all of these different advisors and things, say, oh, ESG is a new hot thing. Okay, well, I'm going to incorporate ESG into this. Tell my clients that uh, you know if they want their uh, values mirrored, 
into their portfolio, I can do that. So then they gauge their values. And then what they get, what, what's relative to those values is the largest corporations on earth's uh, ESG score, which was not created by the client. So it's, it's, it's so far divorced but from uh, the client's actual values. Um, it's so far uh, centralized to what, these corporations are just gonna say whatever they want in order to get a better score. The, you know, the corporate, I mean, corporate accountability is a big part of values aligned investing. And that's what we do on the shareholder resolution side and vote our proxies for our clients. Yeah. So the, that's what they, they should know is that ESG is not for the individual. Mm. It has nothing to do for the individual. It has to do for the best interest of the largest uh, corporations on earth. A friend of mine's wife works for a big faceless bank. And this big faceless bank, I won't name them, but I'm sure you could figure out who it is, got in trouble for doing a lot of a lot of things they shouldn't have been doing to make their company look better. And they got they got fined a lot of money for it. And then once they paid the fines and everything was done, my I was told, I don't know if this is true, but I was told they just said, We're not doing anything. They paid the fine and like, you know what? We're not going to do anything they asked us to. We're just going to move on. We're going to pay the fine, which billions of dollars is uh, when you're a bank, uh, that's not a a lot of money. (laughs) Uh, So that was pretty crazy for me to hear. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's crazy for me to hear that people would, would assume that change would start within the person who was uh, committing the the financial, uh, well, they've been charged so the financial crimes. Um, so, or fin- uh, being behaving unethically in their uh, financial uh, uh, operations. Uh, to think that they're going to change because they got fined, uh, and they they factor that amount of money into it while while they're doing it. <laughs> while they're committing these, fin- you know, th- th- this is not, you know, they're very good at, at uh, statistical challenges and games of that, of that nature. So the, you know, if you, if you think that uh, they're going to change that way, they're not, what they are going to, how they will change is if uh, people stop buying their stock. Right. But typically the largest shareholders of these companies are institutions. Right. And typically, the, these institutions aren't, they're not selling shares in these companies because if they sell shares, now they have less voting rights in these companies and they're owning it not just for the investment piece, but for the voting rights to vote on important issues because it's very hard to get the individual shareholder to outvote someone who owns 30% of a company. That's correct. And, and so what can we do? We can make everyone aware that this, this is occurring and continue to speak this. this uh... Okay, so for instance, um, this, this style of investing, SRI investing, prior to the ESG adoption and all of that, um, it has played important roles into ending genocides around the, around the world. The, these corporations, and that's one of our, uh, that's one of our, uh, you know, factors, uh, uh, in, inclusion or exclusion of, of uh, um, do, do you care about genocide? Do you care about the private pris- prison uh, industry? Um, do you want uh, uh, child labor, uh, human trafficking? Th- these are very important issues. And uh, it seemed as though it was enough of an important issue um, back in, uh, in the 70s uh, for apartheid uh, in South Africa. And, uh, you know, the divestment effort uh, that that came along with that, I I think it was um, um, he sat on the board of General Motors. It was Hmm. um, when was this? I'll look it up. That was uh, Leon, uh, Reverend Reverend Leon Sullivan, and they're known as the Sullivan principles. Um, But uh, so he drafted uh, uh, those principles. And many corporations in South Africa uh, uh, adopted them. 
and uh and so then leon the howard Dr sullivan baptist minister civil rights leader, social activist focusing on increasing of job opportunities for african americans longtime general motors board member yeah that sounds right and uh you know he, he didn't he didn't play uh um uh, you can't say that he's 100 percent responsible but there's a the UN then drafted a, a arms embargo shortly after that uh, for South Africa. It's, it's all about calling attention to things that uh, individuals uh, don't feel is is uh, uh, you know uh, things that they feel maybe amoral or unethical. Uh, and uh, you know, I mean, there, you can go into what morality is, but everyone uh, there there is the way that free markets work as you know, is that we're attempting to vote with our dollar. ESG is going in the direction of limiting that. And, uh, and that's why, uh, that's why I'm coming out and saying, you know, um, ESG is not a good thing. Uh, and it's completely separate from the client getting to choose what is in their portfolio, what matters to them most. Uh, and it's it's the antithesis of that. It's the exact. It's it's in direct contrast with uh, with what values line investing is, and it's very important to know that there may be uh, an overlying agenda that is incorporating that uh, those metrics uh, into what it is that they're attempting to achieve. And it's not the individual's investment objective. I can tell you that, or their their values. Um, it, it's about it's about something else, and uh, and and they're in a club, and we're not in it. So uh, um, I'm just uh, I'm just trying to uh, stress the importance of of this particular style of investing, and and how and to to remove this tarnish that occurred from from these people who who are attempting some other agenda. Uh, not not the individual's agenda. Um, I mean, you know, the look at the Uyghur Muslims in in uh, in China. You know, the the divestment effort uh, in the uh, in the values uh, in the values aligned investment. I, I have the ability to take that out uh, if the individual cares about that. Um, if they're if any particular faith, um, I can align that with their values, and I'm sure that. Uh, as the ESG scores, they have nothing to do with this style of investing. <clears throat> and that's, that's basically my point. It's the exact opposite. What can we do, Ken? What can we do? Yeah. It, or is it, is it too big of a system to fight against? Or is there, is there hope for the individuals out there looking to make a difference? There's definitely hope because all of these institutions and corporations are made up of people and uh, every single one of those people has the ability to uh, uh, see through what it, whatever, uh, whatever kind of veil of automation that they've been put into um, any kind of uh, um, taking orders uh, per se just for a paycheck. You know, I mean, if, if you if you if it goes against how the way it makes you feel, then maybe uh, maybe there's some truth there. Um, and so that's what we can do. Uh, we can all do our own part in whatever way that is. You know, <laughs> uh, I'm not trying to uh, uh, say that I know the ultimate truth or or, uh, or that. Uh, uh, I know that the spirit moves through all things. That's the only thing that I really know. And it's not us who gets to choose, you know, if the sun glows, the sun is going to shine and it will rise tomorrow. Um, so, you know, uh, what we do here on earth is very important and uh, we can use this very powerful tool that we have available to us in the, in the financial, uh, this financial instrument uh, for good, or we can use it to seek uh, control. And so, I'd rather give the individual the control uh, than have uh, the, the largest institutions on earth uh, choosing what's good for us and what's not good for us. Well, everyone, you heard it from Ken and on this podcast, do some research on this, start making a difference and 
make sure we don't give up control to the wrong people. So thanks for everyone for listening. We'll see everyone next time. Bye everyone. Thank you, Jeff.